Okay, Patrick, I was going to say you make it sound very simple, but you don't. But, <laughs> I mean, you're, you're a very talented, Cambridge-educated mathematician that cracked betting on horses while still a student. Um, no doubt plenty of others with those credentials have tried and failed. So what did you see that others didn't? Well, firstly, I don't think the... Uh the you know the the people at Cambridge would think I was especially Cambridge educated. I mostly focused on betting whilst I was there, so I wasn't a my mathematics career was anything but um, impressive whilst there. Um, but um, yeah, I, I just I suppose I had a real go at it. I really tried. I really delved deep. Um, I had advantages that you know I left school at sixteen, so I had time to really get stuck in before I even went there. Um, but I think probably going back to that list I gave before, that business of how you apply the logic, whichever aspect of looking at racing you look at, it's not just, as I say, the basic facts, the basic data, your basic opinion, it's knowing how to apply it. It's thinking a little bit outside the box um, and thinking about ways to improve it, Im improve the way you look at things, maybe improve the data, improve the, way, the method you have. Yeah, you've got to have a real go at it. Now, it's generally considered well, I say generally considered that um, to be successful back in horses, you need to learn by your mistakes. You need to have experience or um, at least to have a mentor. I mean, how, how did you get wise so fast? I suppose just, uh, I suppose just a commitment that whenever I read something, heard something, and obviously when you start out, you get baffled. You don't know what a handicap is. You know, I, uh, like 10, 12, 14, I knew nothing about horse racing. So literally I had to learn everything. I didn't know what a furlong was. I didn't uh, possibly know what a furlong was, but I didn't, know what, I didn't know anything. And everything. So if I heard the talk and anything, I would, uh, you know, I, I would listen, learn, look it up, try and find out anything I could. Um, and just, just, just be relentless. Rather than thinking, oh, I don't do that. I try to acquaint myself with every possible aspect of it. In the end, obviously not all of them you use, but at least understand it. Um, yeah, just immersing. That was, that was I just immersed myself in everything. I put a lot of hours in. Um, I was willing to sacrifice a lot. And that's probably why, really, I suppose I took it so badly when it all came crashing down uh, you know, outside of racing um, because I'd, I'd given up so much, you know, in those early years during uni my life at university was very sort of uh, limited. Uh, and, um, and, and to get things going, I really had put the hours in. You know, and I think that's a big thing. Well, you say limited, but while you were still at university, you set up your tipping line as the professional and you were making £10,000 a month, and that sounds like quite a lot of money for a limited sort of student. Yeah, I suppose the, the, the limited to the extent I would enjoy it, certainly then. In a few, you know, within a few years later, I was, I was enjoying it more. That was the peak. You know, obviously, economic conditions changed, and the market got flooded with other tipsters, so that did go down. Uh, but sure, I, 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 you know, um, I, uh, I, I put the time in, but in the few hours that I, you know, uh, um, that I did have, and with possessions, I did live very well. Um, so, um, yeah, and at the time I didn't probably make any great effort to save because it felt like it was never going to stop and then, and then suddenly it did. Yeah, I mean, to, to um, succeed in the world of being a tipster, you've, you've got to deliver the goods and word gets around or your reputation gets around. So did you have a like, really good fortune with a massive winning run and land, land the ground running when you started off? Yeah, um, no, I wouldn't say there was any particular run. The run I really remember is when I first came back, having had my... You know, time away. So it was a few years later, when I had to stop, um, I did have a really big run then. And I probably held on to the the view that 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 was just you know some very good selections. But maybe at the time I was also fortunate, yeah. and um, I'm sure I'd have got there in the end. But I got there very quickly when I when I made that sort of comeback. I think that was the major run that really came early on. You know, there were ups and downs, but I don't remember any particularly big run. Okay, now I hope you don't mind me saying, but you jumped the gun a bit with the moniker, the professional. I mean, did you keep your real identity sort of a mystery because the student may not have got so many calls? <laughs> well, my, well, my name was out there, but I didn't broadcast the fact that I was a student. But I suppose that was only really technically true because I was probably working 70, 80 hours a week on the, uh, on the racing. And probably in years two and three at uni, I wasn't doing 70 or 80 minutes a week on, on, on uni work. So... Yeah, to some extent I was only a student in name. Yeah. Okay, now did you feel pressure knowing that people were winning or losing on your say-so? Was that an extra burden on you while you were picking winners? Um, yes, I much prefer to win or lose my own money. I found that a lot of pressure. I, I, you know, I did, um, yeah, I mean, I, I took it very, very seriously. When I started, I used to put the message on at 8.30pm and it was years 
I think it was years later, two, three years later, before I ever put a message on at 7.30. It just seemed so lax to do it early. I remember the, it was a real watershed moment, and then I realised that doing it occasionally didn't matter that much, but I would literally record the message at 8.24, and it would take five minutes to do it, you know. Um, it, it was, yeah, I, I was very intense about it, and, and because I felt the pressure of wanting other people to, you know, to do well. In the end, if there was a situation whereby my last message was midday, and something came up, maybe a going change at 1.30, and I placed a bet for myself, even if that was the bigger bet, I'd sooner the horse I tipped won earlier in the day um, because I just so intensely wanted people to, to do okay. You know? Okay, now if, if tipping for all your customers ringing up wasn't scary enough, you progressed to supplying personal advice to Michael Tabor. Now, did that make you look at your selection process differently? Well, you wouldn't say that Michael was the most undemanding of people. Uh, and so uh, that was a factor there, yeah. Um, uh, um, he also liked a shorter price. You know, I think Michael's always liked a, a short one because you can get on. Um, so yeah, he was very much more interested at the front end of the market. So it was a case of probably giving a greater focus to the horses towards the front end of the market. And um, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, so it made some changes, but you know, I was also doing my own punting as well. So not, ma not massively. Okay, so at this point, we're going, to, we're going to fast forward a bit. For people that haven't read your book, can you tell us about the episode that changed your life for the, the gangster, Calvin Hall? Yeah, um, so to briefly take myself back into that, um, I was going along nicely. I, you know, done well out of racing um, and, uh, you know, I bought myself a nice house in Cambridge and everything was fine in the world. And then I got introduced to somebody who was an acquaintance of somebody I knew down the gym, had a business proposition for me, and it turned out to be a shakedown for money. It was an extortion attempt, and it culminated a few weeks later with the person coming round with an associate. And um, you know, they said if I didn't give them a large sum of money, then it was within hours, you know, within hours of days, I forget the exact thing, a while ago now, um, that they would come back and it was seventy thousand. But if, I did, it, if it was within a short space of time, if the money wasn't provided that they'd come back and break my legs or cut them off. This was serious because it was widely known in Cambridge as soon as I made mention of the name that this person was the only suspect in a murder. And so this was, this was very serious stuff. And I took the decision that there was, I could have ignored it, I could have paid it, I could have disappeared. But I took the decision to, to testify and disappear. Um, and obviously that's a situation when you really have to disappear. So I completely disappeared. I was offered police protection. But then I thought, well, someone will know where I am. So I, I disappeared completely. And um, yeah, so I had to stop work completely. Uh, I dealt with my own security. That was extremely expensive. Uh, and uh, so when I came back eight months later, the pressure was really on. Um, but, um, but it made a, a massive difference to, you know, um, to, to me and how I was. You know, I, I had to be so careful during those periods. Um, and um, it culminated seven years later. Uh, you know, the guy was convicted on, on the strength of my evidence uh, for the extortion attempt, but then um, uh, an attempted murder uh, of a policeman came up some years later and he was uh, sent away for 20 odd years. But yeah, definitely, it made a, lot, made a big difference and, uh, and it meant that when I came back, I, I needed to earn quickly and, and that made a massive difference to how hard I worked for a while. I set new records of what I was, able, how, how long I was able to work for and, uh, you know, and, and really probably also bet more aggressively uh, and that suddenly made a huge difference then over the years that followed there. Now that must have been a truly terrifying sort of time. Did, do you think it's changed you forever since then? Yeah, there'll always be differences. I mean, there'll always be, there's, there's still certain security implications, you know. You, um, I, I'd noticed the world around me a bit more than people might realise. You wouldn't be wanting to break into my house without warning me. Um, and. Um, but personality-wise, that was huge. I and mean, I think back to those days, uh, you know, I, I just did nothing other than, than I needed to win. I needed to win quite significantly. And so, you know, for that period, you know, there was steam coming out of my ears all throughout that. Um, and to some extent, you know, I, I, when the book was written sort of a few years later, I wouldn't write it the same way now. It was far too obsessed by how successful I'd been and how much money I'd won and this, that and the other and frankly too boastful. But that was the world I was in because, because I'd been put in such a difficult situation um, 
uh, that that you know it, uh, that that intensely getting it right became an absolute obsession, and you know the, the, there's a face you know if I think back you know that was the face I had on for months you know and if I if I let myself drift for a moment or two, um, you know I I would say some major sporting event came on or something like that I'd notice that but I'd be like no you get back to work this is what you do now and. Uh, you know, and that that was a, for a long time. But even for years afterwards, whenever the pressure was on, I'd be able to recall that. And in the end, I channeled it into a strength that when things got difficult, I could, uh, you know, I could, I could remember and remember what I'd been through and even turn on a quarter of the mindset I had then would, would have been enough. Okay, because before that, you weren't the, uh, you weren't the shadowy figure. Obviously, you've had to be a bit. Um, you enjoyed the trappings of well, Ferraris, helicopters to the races, uh, TV appearances of Esther Ransom. Do you enjoy all that stuff? I don't know about Ferraris and helicopters, plural, but um, <laughs> um, but um, the um, yeah, well, it, it, as I say, it wasn't in forced change that 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 um, that you know for for many years I you know needed to make sure I wasn't photographed. You know, I needed to make sure that you know, and if somebody bumped into me or said, oh, I because of course in that long time, you know, I was told the best place to hide out was in London. And of course, you would bump into people occasionally, or someone saw you, and so, so you'd have explanations ready of how you'd popped into London because. You know, even knowing I was in a place with seven million people was more information I wanted to give out. And so, yeah, that, that changed it. And I'm not as shadowy these days, but, um, but it certainly makes, it, it's certainly made a difference to your outlook on life, yeah.